Yeah, and so the presentation that I'm about to do is, and it explains it throughout, but just to give the quick overview, we did a pretty long discovery process where we did a lot of research um, locally and also just in general what's happening um, across the planet with XR media production and the development of it and where mostly jobs are going to be available within the industry mm -hmm. and field. So a lot of the reason that OpenSignal is moving more towards including this as part of our um, organization is to make sure that um, really early experience and um, exposure to these different tools and software programs and everything is available to the community so that hopefully this industry can be built um, more diverse from the start as opposed to the film industry. But before we get into the actual presentation, we're going to go through terminology 101. Um, and just a quick background, for me, doing the whole discovery process, I learned so much, uh, and a lot of it was confusing, and still, to this day, sometimes I have to go back and read the definition for MR, or AR, or VR. Um, so this is the, the basic overview, but definitely, we can actually share this presentation afterwards, too. Um, it does take a while for it to all sink in. I think that uh, that was something that I, you know, I've been working in media a long time, and I still had a lot of different um, learning curves with this new stuff. So XR is the blanket term for extended reality. Um, that's referring to all real and virtual combined environments and human-machine interactions generated by computer technology and wearables. This includes AR, MR, VR, and really um, projection mapping can fall into that. There's, it's sort of like the, the umbrella term for a lot of different things. VR is virtual reality. <coughs> It's a simulated experience that can be similar to or completely different from the real world. Virtual rea reality is experienced through the use of other virtual reality headsets or multi-projected environments to generate realistic images, sounds, and other sensations that simulate a user's physical presence in a virtual environment. Generally, for VR, people are fully immersed in a totally different reality through a headset. Hey, Hi, welcome. Um, then we have augmented reality, which is an enhanced version of reality created by the use of technology to overlay digital information on an image of something being viewed through a device, such as a smartphone camera. It is not a new reality, but a layer on top of normal reality. Mixed reality is the merging of real and virtual worlds to produce new environments and visualizations where physical and digital objects coexist and interact in real time. Mixed reality does not exclusively take place in either the physical or the virtual world, but is a hybrid of reality and virtual reality, encompassing both augmented reality and augmented virtuality. I think, and Matt can probably speak to this, to me one of the big differences between mixed reality and augmented reality, which on the next slide we'll see some visual examples, is that with mixed reality you can usually like interact with the stuff, um, whereas augmented reality you have a device that is showing you it in the environment, whereas Mixed you would have a headset on and maybe see this room, but then there'd be um, virtual objects in it that you could potentially interact with. I think that one gets the most confusing to me, the difference between mixed reality and augmented reality. Yeah, and I think it remains confusing because the technology companies latch on to different terms and sometimes they contradict each other. Yeah. So like Microsoft's uh, HoloLens is a augmented reality headset, and you can interact. Hi, hey. welcome. Welcome. But, um, so that's why I think XR is a good catch-all, because it dispels with some of that confusion. Which you just kind of have to accept, I guess. Yeah. Um, so then immersive media includes non-traditional formats driven by emerging technology platforms such as 360 video, VR, AR, MR, XR, wearables, and the Internet of Things. It's another way of saying everything possible. So immersive media and XR are kind of interchangeable, but I would say that XR doesn't include the 360 documentary potentially, right? I mean, it's all kind of uh, a little confusing, but, and I think because it's also new too, the way that everybody talks about it is still landing. Um, and then 360 degree cameras, a camera having a field of view that covers approximately the entire sphere of at least a full circle in the horizontal plane. Immersive production is possible in a game engine, 
and with a 360 camera. So we'll learn in a little bit about Unity and the different game engines, um, which then you can experience these things inside of a VR headset. But you could also film reality. A lot of documentary journalists and filmmakers are doing this with a 360 camera, and then you can view that in a headset too. So here's some examples. So this top one is mixed reality, and this is what I was trying to explain, is it's like she's in her living room, she has the headset on, there's these objects that are there, so her actual reality is augmented, but maybe this is playing on a game or something, so when she touches those objects or interacts with them in whatever way, um, which she doesn't have a controller in her hand, but you would probably actually have to have a controller, they might be interactive and do other things. Whereas augmented reality, right next to it, we all know the game, or maybe most of us know the game Pokemon Go. Mm -hmm. That was a really famous early augmented reality. That is, so you see they have their phone and Spider-Man is standing on the floor in their apartment. So you need to have the phone, you can't interact with it. It's, I mean you can, but it's through the phone itself. Um, and it's really just using a piece of technology to overlay something inside of an environment. And then in the virtual reality, they have a headset on and this environment that they're in is theoretically what they're seeing is a completely different reality than the reality of the room they're standing in physically. And then I use this to try to explain XR because it's sort of everything. Um, this is uh, people who are looking at an augmented reality um, in the room where they're uh, seeing potentially like a design that they're able to look at that somebody has created, but really kind of the joke of this is that these people aren't real, this guy on the headset is in a virtual reality looking at them. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's how layered it gets, uh, which I think is important to also recognize is that what's super exciting, new and overwhelming about it is that the technology is iterating so rapidly and the use of it is expanding and artists and technology company leads, they're all finding new ways to do things with it. So I think that it's a little bit like the wild, wild west. Um, and it's a little unknown, which we'll get into like where the whole industry is going to land in terms of work and output and um, all that. So, can, can I ask questions? Sure. Uh, back to that last slide. Yeah. Um, if I just look at the two pictures, like MR and VR, they look very similar, okay? Yeah. And, and I can tell that, uh, I mean, it, the virtual reality, there's a butterfly there, obviously. And then the other one is like, they're, they're real objects, but obviously you're not gonna have fish swimming around you in a, in a normal environment, right? So the difference, I probably should have picked one that had a more like absurd reality. But imagine if this person's standing at their office cubicle but they have this headset on and this is what they see, a tropical jungle. Yeah. So that's the difference is when you put on a virtual reality headset, your entire experience, maybe sound too, becomes this other, which we could maybe do some tests of to give people an experience at some point. Um, you go completely into this other space. Whereas this, these glasses um, allow you to see the room that you're in, but they also allow you to see these virtual objects like looking like it's three-dimensionally floating inside of your room. So is mixed reality a combination of the other three? I mean, that's, I'm just trying to understand what... I, think Matt I, I do better. think that the industry has legitimately confused and contradicted the, the terms mixed reality and augmented reality in particular. Welcome. And augmented reality can be like a visor that you wear, sort yeah. of a minority report situation where you're looking through like a pass-through view of the actual environment you're in, and it's projecting digital content out into that environment. Um, actually, it's projecting it onto your eyes within the headset. But you can interact with it, and it can still be augmented reality, not to contradict your sure, presentation. Yeah, no, no. It's plenty confusing, and um, there's just different, there's different types of augmented reality. Some of it is phone-based, which is what you're highlighting here. Mm -hmm. And then you, you use your phone to like look through and see additional content that's overlaid onto like what your phone is seeing. But you can only see that content through your phone screen, right? 
and that's a form of augmented reality. Mm -hmm. And then they have augmented reality headsets where you're wearing, you know, a visor and 3D content is being overlaid onto your view of the world and you can do simple means of interacting with it like you know, like pinch or bloom, like mm -hmm. these hand gestures. And Microsoft still calls that augmented reality. Okay, yeah. But then, it is a form of mixed reality. And where I hear mixed reality get used the most, it's like um, depictions of like the user of the technology, like in with all the 3D assets and content like swarming around them. Like that's an example of a mixed reality. So maybe more the what you use for XR. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. And also, like, if you're in virtual reality and you are interacting with like actual physical objects that are in the space, that are you know maybe you're picking up like an actual physical cube uh -huh. or piece of furniture, and then in your virtual reality representation of that, it's like animated and or you know, presenting as something else, like I mean, that's a form of mixed reality. Yeah, and do you think that like um, projections and installations and that kind of stuff could be considered a form of mixed reality too? Yeah. So it gets, I think the best way to explain it is it gets really blurred because the, it's still, which we'll get into actually in I think the next slide, we are at like the very beginning. So this is why it's exciting, and it's one of the reasons Open Signal is devoted to figuring out how to um, make sure we have this access now, is in a way where we're at with, or not in a way, 100% where XR is. It's where filmmaking was right around when we started to make the first films. Maybe a few years in, um, it has been quite underway. But what I, as a filmmaker, something that one of the people we met with said that really kind of blew my mind, is they were like, yeah, it's like, in filmmaking before we called something a pan shot, you know, we're like, oh, we're gonna do a dolly, like, like <clears throat> now all that language, all the way of making movies, what it all is, how the, how the um, equipment works, sure it's evolving, but there's some basic foundational stuff that the whole art form and the whole way that everybody works in it talks. XR, as you can see just from what we're talking about with what MR is, all the stuff, is still completely in this early, early stage where what is made, how it's made, the styles and techniques, the leading artists, um, all of that is um, being defined for sure. There are a lot of people doing super amazing things, which we'll get into, but there's so much space for innovation and new voices and to become true trailblazers in defining what this is. So it's a really exciting invitation for the generation of people here right now to co-create this moment in history um, and be part of this new paradigm of human connection, storytelling, communication, interactivity, and productivity, which that is the big difference between filmmaking and XR production. As you'll see through this presentation, XR touches a lot of other things besides storytelling. It is a technology and a media medium that is quite uh, multidimensional in terms of industry and work and relationship and creativity. Uh, all across the board touches aspects of that. So, but what we think is really important is that we educate ourselves um, and, we, and we educate one another so that we can all seize this opportunity to help leap, lead, shape, and advocate for this industry to include all perspectives and stories from its inception. So one of the things that we saw um, locally and then of course I'm sure it's happening internationally too is that just like the tech industry, um, it is being mostly led by uh, white men, and they are wonderful. We met with a lot of fantastic people, and they are actually very aware and super open to the reality that there needs to be specific work done to make sure that uh, people from different backgrounds and identities are being brought in and up through this industry. And as we'll get into, it's a little bit complicated because it's a high skill level field and the reason that so many people have been able to kind of transfer from working in film or television or whatever, or CGI, is because they had this weird skill set that allowed them to make the transition. And then there's a lot of people coming from the coding side and the tech side. So there's this dialogue happening, which is great, and Open Signal's part of it, of how do we, how do we make sure that um, these tools and this education is um, 
has entry point space for all people. This is something that was important to me to add because I was on this research project for about three months and I experienced a lot of emotional <laughs> challenges uh, because it's a really overwhelming topic and as we get into it too, you'll see that it is coming down the pipeline. There's a ton of money being pushed into this. Uh, I think that it's really just a matter of time until our lives are integrated with this technology in a way that we can't even really imagine yet. And it can be really overwhelming. So I found for my own self, you know, with all the things happening in the world, it was sort of emotionally, it can be emotionally challenging to explore the rapid advancement of XR and the reality was being cultivated within the industry. Um, the greater implications of how immersive is being funded and positioned to be fully integrated into our lives and work without a real dialogue or a deeper consideration for how it might impact our well-being, our culture, and our basic understanding of what reality even is when we start talking about multiple realities and all this stuff is a bit challenging to explore. Confusion, fear, outrage, a wide mix of big emotions is possible and even after this presentation or you know digging into learning more about it or starting to work with the tools and practice with the tools you may need to take time to process it research further reflect ask questions connect with other people about it um, this was something I did not expect to experience during the research project and I definitely did okay so this is the background on the discovery that we did so this was really last summer, for the most part, into the fall. The programs department um, met with local XR industry leaders to learn more about what tools and skills are most applicable to success within the field because we are interested in providing workforce development opportunities. This research was conducted for the purpose of supporting the development of new programs and activities here at OpenSignal to support XR education and content creation. We're always really focused on creative output and storytelling here. Um, to further understand what the creative potentials are of these tools and to identify mentors and workforce pathways within our local community. So what we learned is that creative experimentation and an entrepreneurial spirit combined with multiple high-level coding design and project management skills are most relevant and useful for career advancement within the XR industry. What audiences and consumers will gravitate toward is still undefined, but massive companies are actively investing in XR applications for business, communications, and interactive creativity. Jobs, creative leadership opportunities, artistic exploration, activism, and storytelling uses are all accessible options. Exposure to the possibilities and access to the creative tools and education is key. So what we'll talk about a bit is that, yeah, there's this sort of high-level skill set that is needed, but there are really wonderful, for, for high-paid jobs in the field. It's not easy for somebody to, you know, even study this for a couple years and then get a job at one of these companies because it just takes so long to learn the skill set, but there are a lot of um, opportunities within uh, experimenting with different tools, learning different types of software, and getting into entry level. So we'll get into that. These are the companies that we met with. <clears throat> Hinge, <coughs> Torch, The Wild, Super Genius, Invisible Thread, University of Oregon, and Shovels, Whiskey and Shovels? Shovels and Whiskey. Can I, can I ask a question about that last one? Sure. Because uh, I'm sort of interested in the politics of this a little bit. Uh, only, rec only company I recognize for myself personally is uh, the University of Oregon. All the other companies, I have no idea what they do. I mean, Whiskey sounds like I go to the bar and, you know, but, but, yeah. Uh, what are these other companies? Well, on the next slide, I'll tell you. <laughs> um, so Hinge is a commercial animation and CGI production studio. Um, they are a big company. They do really big Hollywood stuff. And um, they do client work, but they're really one of these companies that's doing, you know, when you see CGI in like a Transformers movie, like they're a company that does stuff like that. Super Genius is a game design studio that also does client work. They're also doing very high-end game design for huge companies. Um, they, we had to sign an NDA to go into their office. Um, they were awesome. Everybody that we worked with, that we met with in town was so great. Um, 
Torch is an AR design app company. They are also a pretty good sized company, more of a startup though. <coughs> the Wild, same, a little bit more of a startup, AR business communication design company. So they, I, not actually, let me know if I'm right about this. The Wild does a design for kind of telecommuting yeah. for businesses. So they create an augmented reality app that allows people to do conference calls and then interact virtually through AR? Yeah, through AR and VR. It's like go all in and meet with people across the country and co-create virtually. Yeah. yeah. And then I would say Torch does a lot more of the kind of stuff we saw with the Spider-Man type um, augmented reality example where they're doing stuff that is mostly on mobile phones. Invisible Thread, they kind of do a cross-discipline, so they're a hard one to exactly say. They do XR media production for clients across multiple disciplines, including like doing big event production stuff, and um, you'll see some of the slides in here are from work that they've done. Shovels and Whiskey is a thought leader and an XR project leader. Um, Tawny, who is the head of that, came from the tech side. Um, I think, I believe that she worked at Microsoft and then has been working in XR and doing a lot of community building. U of O has an immersive journalism degree program and um, is doing lots of XR research. Uh, and yeah, their program is a little bit more focused on doing the 360 video documentary style work. Um, but yeah, do you have any other questions about these companies after this slide? Well, I mean, the U of O, the immersive journalism. Uh, it's a master's degree program. My, I have a friend that just got his cell phone. I mean, he's an older guy. He's, he's, a, he's a fabulous painter. I mean, he's been around a long. He's done, I mean, one of the things he did is uh, paint the Last Supper on a grain of rice. One of them. Wow. I, well, I'm just saying he's very unusual. That's yeah. why I mentioned that. And when I think of what's, to me, just personally, what I see, because I was around when cell phones weren't around, you know. Sure. Is that I don't I don't even get off on that in some way, but 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 one of the concerns I have is that from a from a therapist standpoint, I see people really spaced out with cell phones. Their postures are terrible, uh, and I'm really wondering about the effects that uh, I'm a, I love experimental art, and I do that, and it feeds my soul. Uh, and so I'm very much interested in this. But at the same time, there, you have to be here. Yeah. And I find that the problem with a lot of the, the information that comes out, so my friend has a cell phone, and he's, he's telling me the news, which I don't really tune into cell phones much. And I go, okay, but they give you snippets of it. So it's all like shortened, condensed versions of what the situation is. Sure. So when I found out a week ago Saturday that we had the, the virus here, Mm -hmm. uh, and I, 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 I went to the CDC, and I sure. went and I read a document. I can do that because I teach an admin and stuff. And I wanted to find out what can you actually do, and it basically came down to washing their hands. But the information that you get on a cell phone, the information you get on a, a full screen computer, where you can actually go in and look at documents. Yeah. They're sh To me, it's shaping the react. That's the biggest concern I have, is that business, and I'm using that very generally, can shape products, the data mine everything you do, and they can send you, then they do this already, they send you information that's uh, shaped towards your interests. But when you're a researcher like I am, because I am doing some pretty far out research on UFOs, mm -hmm. uh, I know it's done what I've done. I was just, that's it's a long story. Okay. But uh, I ask a question, and they give me what the standard answer is. It's sometimes very hard. You, it's very particular how you ask the question. Mm -hmm. One word can make a, a huge difference in what you get. Sure. And sometimes, like, anyway, so I'm just saying I have concerns about that. Yeah, and I think we will get to talking about those concerns and having like a free open discussion okay. about it. So yeah. what, Devin, get through the presentation, and then I've got some remarks and some prompts that will 
yield a discussion along the lines of what okay. you're talking about. So I'm very yeah. interested in what you're saying. I didn't I mean, expect to say that. Have, have, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we very much have concerns about a lot of the same things, which is one of the reasons that we as an organization are like, okay, yeah. like we need all voices, all minds on this because this is hugely. I mean, this, it's a huge this is a huge thing. It really is. And it's, 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 it's really like I was saying, it's a train that's coming down the track that I don't think is going to stop. So we're trying to get everybody involved in it and figuring out the best ways to be interacting and working with it as a community. So the key insights from our discovery process. Um, and this is, so this was, this research project was completed in September of 2019. This might be a little bit out of date right now. Like, I actually don't know. It'd be interesting that if you think any of this is out of date now, because that's how fast things are changing. Mm -hmm. So the XR field is vast, complex, and iterating extremely qu quickly, like shockingly quickly. VR distribution, so virtual reality distribution, is undefined because hardware is still inaccessible, meaning it's, it's expensive. So one of the reasons that we haven't seen a wide spread of people in VR headsets um, and you know, new types of games and movies and everything is mostly, I think, because it's just so expensive to buy a headset, but there is kind of like a race, I think, to see who can produce the low-cost consumer-based headset, and then that's when the distribution of VR would potentially change. People, though, still have the ability to resist, <laughs> which I think is important, because at the end of the day, if they can't sell the products to people and people don't want to be in VR headsets, then it's not gonna go. But the main reason isn't that people don't want VR headsets, is that they're extremely expensive still. So, in yeah, terms Matt, of how, client work. How much is like the Oculus? I mean, since this report, uh, the Oculus Quest has emerged, and it's being seen as like the most accessible, like cheapest option that um, offers like a pretty robust VR experience. So, I think things have shifted a little bit. I think it's $400. Okay, and it's a standalone headset that you don't need to attach that's, to a gaming that's PC. That's cheap. Yeah, compared so, to... But, you know, yeah. just to back up the point you're making, it's, it's accessibility is still an issue. Yeah. Cheap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Relevant. it's all relevant. It isn't yeah. cheap. But what I think, at least with the numbers I remember, is that around when I was doing this, the cheapest one was $2,500 maybe, or $1,500. Well, the headsets can be anywhere from like 200 to 800 dollars, but then a lot of them have to be tethered to a gaming PC, gotcha. which is like a 1500 dollar investment if you want to have a high quality experience of it. So yeah. that's why. So the main thing is that the hardware is still being developed in various ways for distribution of virtual reality. And therefore, um, when it comes to doing work for clients or businesses or the film industry even, uh, their revenue and these different companies aren't as focused on VR because the direct distro is still challenging. They are, production companies are doing a lot of work at major film festivals. They're creating experiences where you can go and buy a ticket and. There's definitely like a lot of stuff like that happening, but in terms of, you know, oh, I just made this great VR piece, I wanna put it out on the internet, like that's not really there quite yet. Oops. Um, you can put it out on Steam. That's the one place, like Steam's like online marketplace for PC games. Okay. So that's one of the biggest platforms that people use. Cool. Um, so games, training, design, and experiences are currently the main uses for XR production. We'll get into what that means. Cinematic storytelling use is still undefined, but expected to be. So that, I mean that by narrative films. Um, nobody's really cracked the code on that yet. There hasn't been uh, a huge blockbuster narrative film that's VR yet, but doc actually is growing. There's quite a bit of documentary film work happening in VR that people are getting really excited about. Augmented reality and 3D design have the most potential for current jobs and income. We'll get into that. Game engines are pivotal in the creation of all aspects of XR. Unity and Unreal Engine are the main ones. Most jobs within the field require high level skills and a lot of education. Advanced folks can make lateral moves into the field from other careers. But there are ways for entry level practice and participation. Gaining employment at a company is difficult with it without advanced skills, which I've kind of been talking about. 
Um, this is just a little, and this is obviously probably totally different now too, but just an idea of how much spending is going into AR, so augmented reality and mixed reality is the lighter pink color, and then virtual reality is the more red color. So it's like, this is what I mean with the train going on the track, the amount of investments is just going up and up, which that was part of the overwhelm for me is it's like, it's easy as a you know, person who's not maybe as tapped into this to hear about it and be like, yeah, but does anybody really care? It, it, even, like meaning, are people really buying these things and doing this stuff? I think when you see them on an investment going into it, it's a good indication that whether or not we realize it, it will be <laughs> everywhere. Um, and I'm sure 2020 projections, although it might be shifting now because of what's just happening. But. So we're gonna talk about the job market, software, and skills. So augmented reality. So this is within the uh, spaces that you can get into right away. So earning money in augmented reality is accessible with less training and skills. Um, there are several consumer level design programs launched to make creating AR projects possible for more people. AR projects can be sold, shared, and distributed easily because consumers only need their smartphones or tablets to access the work. Clients and companies also hire people to design AR projects. So there are ways to get involved to get these different programs, Lens Studio, Spark AR, Torch, which is our local company. This is a good example of one of the most popular um, augmented reality that we all know, we've all seen. It's when you, you, know, you look at your camera and then it puts a crown on you or changes your face, the stuff that's inside of a lot of social media apps. Um, you, can, you can design these and make money. And actually, um, I've heard that ever since Instagram launched the ability for people to share their augmented reality pieces. There's even more opportunity. People do get discovered that way um, and get hired to design other AR uh, pieces for companies. I would say Torch, um, even though they design an actual software to do it, they also get hired to design these types of things for people. Um, yeah, so th that is a, there is a space for that. There is income for that, and that's where if you have an entrepreneurial spirit, creative spirit, I will say, because I downloaded both Spark and Lens just to see, um, it's entry level software, but you still need to learn it. It's not like, I was thinking that I would just jump on, I do lots of video editing, I was like, I'm just gonna jump on this and start making some of these filters, but I, I was like, okay. <laughs> I need to actually like take a little short class or something, but once you do, there's a lot of opportunity there. This is, so Invisible Harness, one of the is that their name? Invisible Harness? The um, company? Invisible right. Thread. <laughs> yeah. I was like, that's my, my other friend's production company. That's why I just did that. Um, Invisible <laughs> Thread. Uh, this is one of the projects they did. This is a rendering for what it's like to be in, I believe, the Oculus. Is that the Oculus? Uh, no, that's the that's HoloLens. So the HoloLens. So they're yeah. showing a use that you could do as a, I mean, a lot of architects actually supposedly are getting into um, augmented reality for planning client projects and work. So this is an example of augmented reality still, like you were mentioning? Yeah, and then some people might say mixed reality, but again, yeah, augmented reality essentially. Where they, they, they all see each other in the room, they see their office space, and then they see that model that's in front of them. Yeah, so this is a much model. more, so yeah. if we jump yeah. back to the previous slide, and we're all, we've all done augmented reality, probably, if you have a smartphone, or maybe not, I don't know. Um, we're doing these ones with our faces. This is just a different application of it, much more in-depth design work, I mean, in order to build out that whole perfectly moving, operating uh, example of the structure they're planning to build would take a lot of work and effort. So in one sense, level. that's an extension of touching tactile. And that's, you know, that's one of the biggest areas of the brain there is, it's tactile. And so that's sort of tapping into that. Yeah, it is or it isn't, because that's one of the challenges of virtual content is there's nothing actually there. You don't feel it, right? Yeah. But you see, you see it, so it's got to, I'm, I'm really interested in the, in the actual cognitive part of it, actually how that actually works. What, if you would, but it's more complex neurons, you know, I mean, what, what is the pathways, the neural pathways that are exactly working with? So, 
back into just some other places that there's job opportunities for people. There's a lot of opportunities still in design, traditional design. Um, so there's opportunities with companies and clients for designers and animators as well as an, on, an online marketplace that you can sell 3D models, materials, textures, 2D elements, pre-designed animations, and game elements. Uh, Maya, when we met with some people at like Hinge, that really um, high-end production company, they only use Maya. That is a little bit harder, takes longer to learn, but if you are a Maya designer, there's good high-paid jobs in that. But then there's Blender, which is a more accessible um, design software that more people can, I guess, I mean, it's still probably relatively challenging to learn, but it's a little bit more accessible. Um, and then obviously the Adobe Suite. So, so if, if you already know Photoshop and you already know InDesign or whatever, there are opportunities to transfer that skill set into this industry. And I know when I took the Unity class here, we, we were using free examples mostly, but we were on these different marketplaces picking up textures and different things to put into our animations. So all of that material is being created by independent people and production companies and design studios that are um, hiring creatives to make these things so that people can be building in these uh, game engines, which I think is the next, yes. So game engines are the main design hub for all things XR. My way of putting it, and maybe Matt can elaborate better on this, is that the game engine is like the universe, and the project is like the planets or the galaxies inside of it. All the elements of your project, whether it's the story, the characters, the sounds, the models, the interactivity, um, is all built within the game engine or brought into the game engine, so you can pull elements in that you have somebody else make, or you, or, and then you can generate them within. And then once it's inside of the game engine universe, you can then use coding. Um, so you do have to know basic coding and more advanced coding um, inside of the software. And then you can change all of it into a game. It could be a VR experience, a story, an app. So it's a little bit uh, endless what's possible inside of a, a game engine. And then, well, I'll just go through this, and then if you want to elaborate on that. The quality is what makes a game engine, and the main ones are <coughs> Unity and Unreal. Um, there are more Unity designers. It is a free, accessible software, and there are potentially more jobs and uses for Unity. But similar is Maya to Blender, Unreal Engine. There's less people, but it's a more specialized skill set. So there's not as many jobs potentially, but if you're an Unreal designer or you're both, you might be able to get a higher paid job with an Unreal um, skill set. And it is desirable for people to have that skill set, but Unity is more common. So what makes a game engine a game engine? It has a graphics rendering engine supporting 2D and 3D graphics. It has a physics engine that supports collision detection, which Matt can elaborate on. It has an audio engine to load and play sounds and music files. It has scripting support to implement gameplay logic. Logic. A world object model defining the contents and properties of the game world. Animation handling to load animation frames and play them. Networking code to allow for multiplayer downloadable content and leaderboards multi-threading to allow game logic executing simultaneously. That's a little confusing. Memory management, artificial intelligence for pathfinding and computer opponents. My take on it is that people, and, and Unreal and Unity are the two that are out there. A lot of production companies and um, tech companies actually design their own game engine and use it for their own projects. My understanding of it is, is that What's happening with XR and what's possible with XR is so vast that there had to be a way to kind of do it all inside of one thing. And it came from video games ultimately and then has expanded to include a lot of different aspects of what's possible with this media. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't have said it better. Needless to say, it gets very technical because it comes from this very technical space of <laughs> video game design, which includes like multiplayer online video games where you're networking different computers and bringing people together in a shared experience with a shared like physics system, you know? So there's levels to it, yeah. but the surprise twist has been this software is what is being used to create these new types of content for virtual and augmented reality 
and then that has spread out to just all different industries and applications far outside of video games. And I don't think anyone really saw that coming. So. Yeah. What um, coding language does Unity use? C sharp. Is it its own? Is that a language only used in Unity, or is it? It's used elsewhere. Um, it's derived from Microsoft's .NET framework. So you could go to coding school and learn .NET slash C sharp, and it's applicable outside of Unity. Unity chose that language. And then Unreal Engine inconveniently uses C++. So a different programming language. And all this stuff can seem and be very intimidating. But the one thing I've learned about programming is if you learn fundamentals of programming, they're very transferable across different languages, similar to yeah, if you learn basic a, a human of language. How, yeah. Yeah, it's all the fundamentals hold true across the different languages. So if you learn one, you're essentially learning how, how to learn them all. Yeah, in shorter order. the jargon well, may change, but the functionality. Is, yeah. I think what's cool about it, my whole background is in film production, and what I think is exciting is that this seems similar to me too, and that it's an opportunity for people to work together in ways that have different skill sets. So. You might be a designer or a storyteller, and then you find people who are coders, and you work together on a project, and everyone brings their specific skill set. Because like that was when I first learning learned about this, I got really overwhelmed because I was like, I want to try to make an immersive film, and I was like, I'll never learn all of this. But the reality is, is that it's as it's getting more specialized. It's just like you would hire a gaffer who does really great light design to work on your film instead of be like, I'm going to do it all. I think that as things shape up more, even within our direct community at Open Signal, there'll be people that are specializing in different skills and you collaborate together to bring a creative idea forward. Um, and then I'm sure just like anything, there'll always be the super genius people who can do it all somehow. <laughs> um, but yeah. So these are some of the hard skills. Uh, Multi-skilled people are most hireable. These are just what we learned through the discovery process. Coding, engineering, computer science, math, business, Software development, user experience designers, video game designers, 3D modeling, texture and material designers, animators, and compositors. Something that was really cool to learn is that having fine art skills um, and technical art skills is a huge plus. Uh, a lot of people express that they will end up with people that have tech skills or coding, whatever, but to be fully rounded if they also actually know how to, like, especially if you want to work in. Um, animation or game design, if you also have fine art skills, which takes a long time to achieve, of course, that's a huge plus. Um, project managers and producers also have opportunity. There's a lot of uh, holes in the industry for people that just have great project management skills. Several companies said that like people who've worked in indie film have been really useful to them because they have a perspective about just like you know, figuring it out on the spot and being able to work with a lot of different elements and tools because similar to independent film production, there's a lot of unknowns. And so each project that I think a lot of these companies are getting, they might be the first people who've ever done this certain style of project. And so they're figuring out how to creatively execute it, but also just like, how do you budget it? How do you keep it on time? Like, all of that is also new um, aspects of this industry. And then writers and soundtrack, Composers, not as much work. I would say you probably have to go to LA if you really want to be a, a writer for a game, a video game, or soundtrack composer for video games or different XR things. But locally, I'm sure there's opportunities for that too, but just specifically job-wise, it sounded like that is more on those deep post-production and the super pre-production side of projects and a lot of what the companies locally do, um, that I guess gets farmed out to other people. But there's work for writers and, and composers, too. So practical uses of um, XR. Training and education. Medical, so you see put this up here. Um, safe ways to teach high risk work. So instead of, uh, actually not just medical, there's a lot of different types of training that people are interested in using XR for so that they don't have to have their employees risk anything. Um, for their own safety in order to learn. Live events, gaming, 
architecture, design, pre-visualization, which we've seen. Real estate, um, viewing properties virtually. That's usually 360 camera, but we've probably all seen a little bit of that already. Building custom apps and designs. Experiences that engage stories and social issues. Workforce transformation, immersive meetings, remote work. There's a lot of use of avatars and virtual rooms coming down the pipeline. Marketing. Brands can offer immersive product experiences. There's a lot of people in retail that are really interested in creating ways for people to interact with their products virtually before they purchase them. Something that's sort of terrifying to me is talk of virtual malls and things and whatever. But yeah, all that is happening. I have a question. Yeah. I'm just curious, like this remote work, this is avatars and virtual rooms. Is that the idea where it's sort of like these immersive meetings where instead of going into you would like your avatar would go into the virtual office building yeah so the thing that i've seen i've seen people talking about is that like say you were going to meet with a team of people based in europe you could instead of just be on a conference call and this i mean they are doing this already in the future, not far from now, you might have a complete 360 scan of what you actually look like. So it's not even like some cartoon version of you that then they can use to show you sitting in the room. Or that it will, you would use. I mean, it's not like you would be there. So it would be like you're in a virtual, you as an avatar are in a virtual space interacting with other people in a meeting. But you're controlling it still. You're on a headset. But yeah, that's and one they, of the things the they've done. In the meeting the idea is that the people, whoever else, there's a physical meeting happening somewhere and like the odd one out, or they're all meeting in this. That's a good question. Either or. I don't know. Either or. And they all just wear the headsets so that they can see the one person mm -hmm. with them. Everyone's out on their chairs. Maybe. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is all just stuff that um, yeah. we heard uh, is either already happening yeah. I'm just curious to happen how or may happen in the future and how it works and what it looks like. I personally don't totally know, but I, yeah. That I think that's at a stage where the fidelity of the experience hasn't quite reached its potential. Mm -hmm. So it's arguable whether it's more effective just to meet like FaceTime meetings or, you know, meeting apps that are video based because avatars and virtual rooms is like you know a couple layers of things could go yeah, wrong yeah i feel like there's so many technical difficulties <laughs> already with getting and the audio uh, <laughs> it seems really silly right but it's to devon's point like it's definitely coming like that's what the technology companies are working towards and once they have eye tracking sorted and in place then it's going to be a really compelling way to meet virtually as opposed to like fly across the country for a minute. right or yeah, and I do think that, like when I when I first was learning about it, I was picturing like <coughs> video game characters or something. But then I learned that it would probably end up being like a highly real representation of a person. A hologram. Yeah, like a hologram. <laughs> um, which whatever we can get into all the sci-fi conversations <laughs> about how weird that is. But yeah. <laughs> okay, and then. So this is where I'd say open signal. I mean, we are interested in workforce development, helping people get hard and soft skills, um, connecting in for mentorships and practice and community building um, in terms of what's possible for earning an income in this field. But as a creative space in general, we're leaning more towards wanting to help, um, like for our purposes, for things that we might be doing uh, in terms of fellowships and things like that. We're interested in experiences, storytelling projects, art making, and activism with these tools. So I'm just going to show you a couple uh, examples of experiences. So experiences are, I think, one of the things that has been pretty successful so far. Like I said, the major film festivals are doing this. I mean, they all have ticketed experiences. There's awards for the best design experiences. Marshmallow Laser Feast is a company that um, I believe yeah, they, they uh, premiered at Sundance, their Sweet Dreams. Um, and this is just to give you a little idea of what an immersive experience might be like when it's super big budget and it's at a big film festival. And this is at a gallery. 
So what you're seeing is what they're seeing in the headset. So it's a very intimate experience for the people that are actually in the experience. about them, but that's just to give you a little bit of idea of some of the types of creative agencies and companies that are really positioning themselves. How long is the experience? Yeah. I don't know. I would imagine it's like you can choose how long to stay in it based on how you interact with it. Uh, that's how most of them, I think, are. But with the ticketed stuff, they probably have a time limit where the next audience has to come in. Well, what, um, well, what is the extent of the body pack and like that other part, like parts? Like what they're wearing? Yeah. Look like they're wearing a laptop, VR-ready laptop, like in a backpack, oh, okay. which would allow them to be untethered. And what, yeah. Which is nifty. Yeah. There are some like specific safety concerns with VR <laughs> stuff too, because it's like, I mean, well, that's. I guess I should say that is that one of the reasons I think it's probably going to land. Personally, my theory is that we're going to land a lot more towards augmented reality than virtual reality, because. I, I think that for one, you know, maybe gaming and stuff will still love virtual reality, but I think that it's going to be a little bit too disorientating for human beings to get super VR everything and potentially unhealthy for a lot of reasons. Um, and I think people might reject feeling like they have to wear headsets all the time, uh, whereas the augmented reality will be potentially easier for folks to um, feel like it's integrated into their lives in a way that's not as disruptive. But my point is, is that this is the big debate in the industry. I mean, you know, like we're saying, they're investing all this money, there's all this stuff coming and happening, but it, it feels kind of like a snow globe to me right now, where like, it's like all these ideas and all these products and all this stuff's all shook up, and then kind of where it lands and what ends up being what the culture is like, yes, this is what we want to use and we want to do, um, I think, we will have, I think citizens will have more of a say in it than we might realize, uh, which is good, because I think that we should, since it is so immersive. Okay, this is an example of a company. To me, film used to be like. It's not, can you guys hear that? Because it's actually, I think, only coming out of my laptop. However, What's caused me to transition into this space is I feel like as a medium, it gives us whole new ways of putting people into vantage points they've never had before. And I find that like deeply, deeply fascinating. I was a filmmaker that transitioned to all um, augmented and virtual reality. One dance duet, one David Bowie song, and one piece of architecture to expose viewers to it from a bunch of different vantage points. So in certain scenes you can talk to them and you can change the size of the dancers, you can ask for more of the dancers, you can change the sets by, by speaking to the sets. In other scenes it's really much more about your own physical movement and your attempt to try to touch the digital. The demand of the entire experience was that you have to move through it to find the next story beat, you have to be curious enough to look around to find where the next piece of story is happening. We chose to do a project around dance because it's one of the most ancient forms of communication that we have. And so my question against that was, if I take that into all of these new emergent medias, what do I get? To me, the HoloLens is the most extraordinary device I've ever encountered. I mean, I feel like it captures and gives back everything I wish technology could do for us. I mean, I think the thing that excites me most about mixed reality is just the degree to which the digital and the real worlds are going to keep coming closer together. The thing that I love about the HoloLens the most is that it's so smart. There's total suspension of disbelief because the digital is there and your, you know, your world is, is there too in full color. Okay, and so uh, Melissa is, I believe, the head of, um, I forget what it's called at Sundance, but is an independent filmmaker that made the transition and then is a big part of moving 
these things into traditional film uh, festival circuit and all that stuff. Okay, so AR and VR activism, immersive journalism, and 360 documentary. This is something we're especially interested at, at Open Signal. Um, people are utilizing the tools for a lot of super interesting things. Um, I think, I mean, you can just read these that are here, but I was going to talk about um, some other cases that I've read about where people are using augmented reality to rewrite histories to be able to show um, within a community environment what actually happened in this area instead of what everybody believes happened. There's a lot of artists that are um, also doing different types of journalism work where they're uh, engaging with certain communities and then um, playing that work for people who might have otherwise felt a resistance to a certain community, like kind of using things to allow people to experience other people's ex experiences differently. So there's a lot happening with that. Same thing, it's all being defined and um, people are uh, experimenting and, and trying a lot of different things. And then with the immersive journalism and 360 doc, if you're interested in that, I think one of the most uh, fascinating spaces for that right now is MIT's Open Documentary Lab. If you go to that website, um, there's just a lot happening at their lab and in general, um, locally to the U of O program for immersive journalism is doing a lot of excellent work. Are they calling it immersive? Because it was like a multimedia journalism program. Are they calling it immersive media? No? I th thought so. We met with Donna, who is the, um, I think the head of that, of that, and I, I believe that's what she called it, but I'm not positive now, so I don't know. Maybe it is, I mean, we could look it up and see. I think that's also part of the point, and part of the point that we're making here is that this is not very new at this stage, but it's going to be under the umbrella of just multimedia and media creation in general before too long. Yeah. A subcategory called immersive, but maybe at a point we'll just drop immersive and it'll just be yeah. the new forms of media that we're making. And then art making. There are a lot of artists doing super interesting things with uh, creating augmented reality, gallery shows, virtual reality, performance art pieces, um, mixed reality, all, all of the things. A lot of people, uh, locally, one of our friends, Sarah Turner, is doing this mobile projection unit. So people are doing immersive stuff with um, projections and projection mapping, art-based work. Uh, yeah, I, I, I recommend researching um, XR artists internationally right now. There's a lot happening that's really fascinating. Um, and same thing, I think that a lot of them came from various backgrounds, coding backgrounds, um, traditional design backgrounds, and then figuring out a lot of universities are starting to have um, immersive art making tracks and things like that, so. <clears throat> so overall, I think the most important point to, that we want to drive home and open up a dialogue around to at Open Signal is that we just really think this is a really important time for us to be experimenting, collaborating, and educating ourselves and one another so that we can help define what's possible with this industry, but also how to have control over the tools instead of the tools having control over us, and to hopefully utilize all these different things to bring ideas and stories and connection forward instead of disconnection. I think that there are a lot of concerns that are legitimate, and so that's part of why we're um, so invested in helping figure out how to be at the table from the start in terms of the conversation. Um, so Open Signal specifically, we have the opportunity to help shape the emerging field, to be inclusive under represented voices from the start, by providing the tools and early education necessary for exposure to this rapidly iterating technology and its use potential. We think that Open Signal can become a key entry point for inspiration, creative expression, mentorship, and professional development. And in my opinion, more importantly, community building. Um, I think that just like with the film industry, uh, the best work comes out of groups of people that enjoy getting to know one another and collaborating on a project together. And we hope that here we can cultivate a lot more of that kind of space and opportunity for people to 
find one another to do things, um, and then we have the tools and resources to support that. So that is the reason that we did this research project, and it's the reason that Open Signal, and we'll be announcing it more and more over the year, 20, this whole year, um, we're getting more involved in supporting this emerging media, medium. <laughs> When you when you reference the research project, is that like open signals like research into the industry? Like yeah, the I think it came in maybe after. So we did a, a about a three month discovery project where we went um, on a bunch of different meetings with local XR production companies and did a lot of research online and read articles and books and things and to determine where the space is. Uh, what's happening, what's important, how do people get jobs, what kind of skills do they need, like everything is kind of talking about here, so that we could decide as an organization how, when, and what it would look like for us to be as supportive as possible to this emerging field. Um, which we had already been doing anyway. Uh, Matt has been a part of Open Signal as an educator in Immersive for two years? So, yeah, so we've been developing it in various ways, but getting to the point where we were ready to um, I think invest more and we wanted to just understand the whole landscape so that as we build out programs and get tools, they're the right tools and we're able to um, help people in the right ways and we're not just kind of being like, okay, you know, just being educated behind our decision making. Thank you. A rose is a question in your mind as you're listening to that. Well, I, would, I was just going to say that I think it's absolutely necessary uh, that uh, at this level get involved with it. Because if it doesn't, you'll be clearly, uh, I mean, I see this as a social issue. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Uh, I mean, I think uh, the mainstream culture is aware of uh, other cultures, and they are extending out in other ways. I, I've had, I, I just did a course online on cultural sensitivity for uh, one of my licenses. And I learned a little bit, but at the same time, I, it's like, uh, I had questions too, you know, about it. Uh, it's really challenging. This, these aren't my words, but if, in essence, the, the, I see that the main problem we're all having is one of consciousness. And one of seeing how we're more alike, how we're all alike versus, it's very easy to see the differences. We've done that so long that we, in some ways, stuck. We have to see the commonality between all of us. Mm -hmm. We're going to survive with all of this. Yeah. yeah. There's a couple, a couple things there. There's, there's levels to the questions that we're asking about the technology, right? We just went through a decade's worth of pretty intense technological transformation with social media, for those of us that have been on board with that experience. And I think there's a lot of anxiety around and coming out of that experience, and maybe just now we're starting to have some distance from it, understand a little better what's at stake, what the technology companies have been up to. Um, so there's like naive users, there's fewer naive users of social media in particular than ever, probably at this stage. Like Facebook. Um, yeah. They should just come up with that. Yeah, so. so we can talk a little more about that. And then Jefferson, you made a point about consciousness, a, a necessary consciousness shift and or um, you were alluding to empathy that needs to be fostered among people. And Devin pointed out um, immersive journalism as this emerging field where purportedly VR or AR can be used as an empathy machine, the sort of phrase that gets thrown around. Yeah. And I think you can be skeptical of that, and you probably should be, because I question whether or not immersive media is really going to ramp up people's ability to empathize in ways that traditional, more traditional forms of media can't, for example, video. You know, seems like if, if video can't do it, why then is a virtual reality headset going to help anymore? But 
it does do something different. It does tap into uh, body, memory, and it does allow you to put people in a first-person perspective of someone else's experience. So I do think there's ways in which it absolutely can tap into empathy in ways that other media can't. But I balance that with the sort of hype and the phrasing um, and the implications there. Two, two thoughts based on what I was just hearing from you. Um, should we give a couple other people a chance to ask questions and then we can delve a little deeper into some of those concepts? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a big topic. Yeah. Um, go ahead. I think what it sort of comes to my mind is the idea of like digital divide and how that has become, you know, like the digital divide slash digital literacy because really the, even the term digital divide has come to mean different things over time. So like it's not necessarily like whether or not you have access to having a smartphone because now there's a huge amount of, I don't know the actual percentages, but like within the millennial generation, like a large amount of people have a smartphone and have access to the internet. So it's not necessarily like the access to it, but I feel like that what seems relevant to me is like the pacificate, like the use of technology to pacify. So like where similar to like a TV or something where like if you don't have money for a babysitter or for like actual interactive like stimulating after school programs, things like that, then you sit your kid whether they're a toddler or like whatever and they're in the game or they're in a screen and so they have access to the screen but it's just used to sort of deaden or pacify as opposed to using it as a tool for creation and interaction with society and I think that's where it's interesting to me to see how once immersive media and XR becomes even like deeper ingrained and like deeper of a tool that is like fully immersed <laughs> into society, how much that, you know, who it's going to be a tool for and who it's going to be used to sort of like pacify, you know, because the access to it's going to be like, like, what are we going to be using it for? And I think that is really interesting, thought provoking. Yeah, there's a couple things there, right? Like, we already have this thing called the digital divide where people are being left out of just basic computer skills and communication skills with social media, which is kind of essential to having a professional life and conducting a business and all these sorts of things. You're expected to know how to use these tools. And what Devin just presented is, okay, there's this whole new, more advanced like skill set that's kind of impending where we're gonna go deeper with technology. We're gonna introduce coding as like another language that people are gonna derive power from, essentially, um, in terms of opportunity and that sort of thing. Um, so it's, it's intimidating and it's like, if we already have a problem, are we gonna have a much worse problem and a widening gap in society because of it. Um, and then how alarmist should we really be about the technology because you know you, you mentioned like it being used to pacify or you know maybe think of a phrase the opiate of the masses mm -hmm. the technology being used to just lull a population into some state where mm -hmm. we're easy to predict or something. So there, there's levels to it. Like there's a, there's a sense in which we could be very paranoid about how the technology is already being used or evolving. And then there's this other pers perspective that's like, well, you know, books transform society. Television further transforms society. And people were worried about kids turning into vegetables just staring at the TV every night and, and that kind of dividing the family. And now, 
yeah, we've got a new form of technology, and of course it's going to evolve us. So it's two different ways of kind of uh, viewing what's happening or about to happen. Um, I guess I'm just going to give two responses to each of what <laughs> I'm hearing from you, and then we'll hear from you, and then. Um, kind of in that same vein of, of looking at all at the evolution of what we've seen so far in media, like it starts as technology and then it moves to media. Um, I was a little bit curious about like that process of democratization and like dis disruption, uh, for lack of a better word. As, in your research, have you found anything that I guess speaks to like a disruptive process um, at, any, at any point or and then? I guess moving to towards media, like thinking about um, creating something online was a space that was reserved for higher skills, like we were talking about. Um, but now, you know, we have platforms to for to lower that bar, um, so if more people can be producers of content and producers of media. Um, do you see? Have you heard any conversations or any things of that moving in this AR media <coughs> space? Um, that's a really good question. Yeah. I think that in the research specifically with the people that I met with or we met with, I think I would say all of them are thinking about it, right? And everybody has a, a pretty, not everyone, I won't name names, but most people within this group are wondering like, okay, we can't just kind of sit here in our tech companies making all this, like they're aware that it could be a huge problem and a lot of the big festivals and stuff are all talking about it too. They're just like, okay, we can't um, turn this into maybe potentially more, even worse than any uh, other art form for lack of accessibility and lack of diverse voices because the tech, because it's such a systematic like deep thing, right? To the people that are up there already with the skill set just making this jump over to this new industry. So they're all talking about it, and I think that um, these different types of open source software, like all these things are coming from this dialogue. And, but I personally, even after doing that research, think I have concerns that ultimately, unless there's more places like OpenSignal and like more community uh, spaces that are really recognizing how important this is um, and investing time and resources into um, creating different types of pass pathways to utilize the tools. I think it's highly likely that it's like these really rich companies um, control all this wealth in these spaces and then they give us the Facebook or whatever version of it to do what we want. And then on the flip side of not the tech piece, I think there is disruption and a lot of interesting stuff happening and will continue to happen in terms of, I think, the immersive storytelling and the doc storytelling. Um, because I think that what's powerful about that is maybe similarly to where we were when people could become like YouTube influencers or something. Um, I think that there's gonna be a lot of people from across the planet that if and when they gain access to the ways to make this work, will start delivering pieces that are just totally mind-blowing experiences within certain cultures and communities that nobody has seen. And I think there probably will be this big sort of interesting uptick of, of that, but yeah, like how how people are gaining access through the distribution piece, and then the fact that, you know, and we all know this, it's like one thing for people who are super wealthy at the top of whatever industry to talk about what the issues are, it's a totally different thing for them to be actively engaged in trying to create change. So I do think that Open Signal, not that like we're the most important organization in the world, but I think that a space like this, what PCC is doing, I think that um, anywhere that people are talking about it and trying to figure out these access points is pretty crucial, like actually extremely crucial to it um, because of the education too. But I don't know if I answered your question. I feel like I kind of rambled. I've been talking a lot. Yeah, we've been through the rambling. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Part of the, uh, well, my experience. Can I just I mean, first but, Yeah. Um, that was sort of segues perfectly into what I was going to ask about in, in your experience of speaking to like <clears throat> these various companies. Did you find that there was um, a discussion about global culture and the opportunity for this in 
also to your point about the opportunity to engage more globally, or was that sort of in the background or not really? Um, I, we didn't talk about that necessarily sort of specifically, but I think overall, yeah, like that's the mindset is that a lot of these companies are, um, you know, interested in the worldwide market for what they're developing and what they're doing, the ways that they're working, especially the ones that are like George, just making like an app company. Um, yeah. Yeah, and just to me, that's sort of the, the antidote to like the paranoia is like, well, how can these tools make it easier for us to collaborate in a meaningful way with someone in, you know, in Africa or in various places? Uh, okay, I get what, I think I didn't totally understand your question. Like, I, I, I feel the lack of global culture in Portland. Like the, yeah. And like, it's, I'm like sort of starving for it right now because I come from international places. So I'm like, if this is something that could allow me to work better internationally, that would be, better than what we have today. No, I mean, hundred percent that like, like the company, um, The Wild, like they're all about, yeah, creating these work environments and ways for people to globally interact. I think also with MIT Doc Lab, like when you look at those sites, you look at people that are doing immersive journalism, like most of the stories that are being produced aren't necessarily coming out of the US. Like there's definitely a, um, a lot of discussion around that. I think the companies themselves, um, are probably a little bit more engaged in being software developers and distributing those tools and other client work, which most of them are so busy with their client work that I don't know how much they're gonna like for instance the game company that we worked with, like where we met with, they were very like, you know, barely had time to talk to us. Like they just gotta get this game design out like really high stress environment is what it felt like to me. Um, so and that's, I guess, what's confusing about it too, is that there's just so many different ways that people can be working in the field, that they all have different objectives and interests in terms of what they're developing and why. Uh, but from the storytelling, you can take the storytelling, doc, filmmaking side, um, if I had to guess, that was kind of, I guess, what I was saying to, to what you were asking. I think that um, there will be, just from what I know about applying for film labs and fellowships and stuff like that, like they're looking to support people from not the US mostly that are telling stories and cultures and communities that we haven't heard. And I think that that will ultimately, even though maybe they're not doing all um, like immersive storytellers right now, I think like Matt said in another five, 10 years, immersive storyteller and like storyteller filmmaker may be more and more kind of all under one general concept of what it means to do this kind of stuff. In terms of documentary, um, like I was saying, narrative will always be somewhat of a different space. I think also what we've seen in recent years is that this whole promise of the free and open web, like being this unifying paradigm, has proved to be something that actually can be controlled and manipulated by whatever states or interested parties want to add a level of what people can see and experience and what information they can or can't access. So I see that as bearing on everything that happens in Immersive too, because it's gonna all wind up being internet-based. And so it's unfortunate, but you know the ways we can interact are probably still gonna be regulated and policed by whatever entities globally. Um, that, that's at least a concern that I have. Um, among other other concerns, like um, we haven't talked about this yet, but like new levels of uh, biometric data that can be derived from using these new types of products. Like when you interact virtually, or if we want to interact virtually with people in Africa or across the globe, um, we're going to need to have reliable eye tracking and like facial tracking so that we can have a good experience of interacting with a virtual human. But who's actually managing and accessing that data because being able to determine what you're looking at and not only that but like changes in your body temperature or even like uh, skin tension 
things like that that will eventually be derived from like VR goggles or whatever sensors they're putting on us, um, or we're putting on ourselves. Um, it's just a whole new, more granular way of, um, of uh, manipulating us potentially. So, and they're two sides of the same coin. So that's another reason why we're trying to facilitate these types of dialogues is because we want our community to be able to start anticipating how we can be effective in voicing our concerns as citizens so we can have a hope of helping shape like how things progress. I had a totally other question and then after you spoke, it opened up a different topic for me. And I wanted to ask you that during the three months of the research that you had while you were engaged with these various companies, did they seem to have an interest in supporting what you were doing? Yes. Very and, much. And I guess the, the feedback is that now you've got your present, thank you so much for doing all that and presenting mm -hmm. this, but at, once you assess what those needs are, how well do you think that those that you can reflect those back onto the industry and the industry will listen and help provide. Because you say in accessibility, like you are resource and funding restricted. Like mm -hmm. we, we all know that. Um, that having a lot of this technology on hand isn't feasible. Mm -hmm. Right? How do you think that industry could best support you and will they are they willing to? Yes, I think they are very interested in willing. That, that was what was nice is that even though like I'm saying how they um, create pathways within their businesses and all these different things, I don't know exactly what that looks like, but they all are open to figuring that out. And what that looks like at this point with us is that they have, many of them have decided to be mentors for people coming through our new media fellowship program. Part of the mentor pool, the, the artists actually get to choose their mentor. So um, we partnered with Torch on an event that we did that was a fundraiser um, for the organization. Uh, I think that as we continue to uh, establish more training and opportunity for people to advance their skills here, when we have somebody who's ready, we have this great set of contacts now that we can be like, hey, do you have space for an internship for this person? Or maybe the, is there a job? I think like with the film industry, we are starting to get more, us as an organization that's evolved in the past couple years to be seen as a space where there might be people who are ready to take different types of paid positions out in the field. So there's a lot of industry folks on the film TV side that are coming to us to ask for job recommendations. I anticipate that happening more and more on the XR side once we have um, you know, more opportunities for people to learn. The, the bigger problem at this point, and Matt can probably speak to this more than I can, is that it's still so new and the software is still so new that if somebody came to us tomorrow and asked for us to recommend 10 people for a job, like I don't know if we could um, within our own community, but we see it as a long-term investment in getting this going here so that in a few years from now, we can't we can be like, oh yeah, well, this, these people are ready and they, you know, they're community designers or whatever. Um, so I think that the local industry is definitely interested and supportive. Um, I would imagine if you know we do more fundraisers, those kinds of things, they are uh, willing, and then for hiring and internships too. I just flashed on something. I, my mind's going different ways, but um, it seems like a good idea to bridge cultures uh, or to help make. You you have to be aware of your own culture first. And the only way you really know that that I that I've seen anyway is that you have to get outside your culture somehow. And then by being outside your culture, I mean for me it was just, by being outside your culture. Then when you come back, you're just more more perceptive of what you're acting, the suit that you're in. You cannot help. I mean, you're so inculcated with your culture. Most people aren't even aware of it. So. One way to bridge different communities is actually bring the other community in and find something that's they both sort of like, and I could sort of that. I mean, this is, and you, and the, if you both like this, whatever it is, then you can dialogue and sort of engage a little bit with that. Uh, I teach second language learners massage. I've also taught at a high school some years ago. I mean, just briefly when I did a, an internship, uh, and. I've seen. I've been in Portland since 1980, and I've seen lots of 
well, huge changes, and it was huge changes for most people anyway. Sure. But, uh, but there's some, I teach a lot of Chinese right now. Do you think I understand Chinese? Absolutely no way. I mean, I, I can remember, and I, but I do engage them, I sort of play a little bit with the word sounds and say, tell me, how do you say that, you know, that kind of a thing. And um, somehow, I mean, so I see a lot of also tension you know, in, here in Portland uh, from the homeless, from people reacting to this, and, and particularly because this coronavirus originated in China, and I've heard conversations like they, people are tense about that a little bit with, with other Chinese. They sort of think it's their fault. I mean, I'm not saying everybody, but I just felt that vibe. And um, so I think this is one way to find, this. and I think you absolutely have to be involved with it and involve other communities with it uh, and, and get, get people to mix a little bit somehow. With yeah. It. Yeah, I've been really fascinated by like, it's such a highly educated community here, like very highly educated. Like I think 50% of Portlanders have a master's degree. But, and I, I just, I have been really very surprised by, yeah, just the lack of, of real um, global um, experience. It's sort of like the idea of globalism is here, but like the actual experience of it is very lacking. Um, and I'm, having grown up in New York and in, in, in DC, I I feel like a real sadness around that, mm -hmm. and and I feel a little bit less isolated because like I, I feel like my experience is so different from a lot of people here. So I just wonder if like if the VR it, like XR industry is like aware of their power to like impact places like Berlin, for instance, mm -hmm. and also. Yeah, for sure. I definitely think there's a lot of people thinking about it in those terms. Actually, the um, the head of the immersive journalism program at U of O specifically researches um, immersive technology uh, for disability, like utilizing. She did a whole project on how Second Life um, has been like one has been an extremely uh, beloved program for people with various physical disabilities. And there's some of the users that are still using it, like very, like, you know, hardcore users of the program. And so she just has been looking into how these technologies can be um, you know, supporting different types of people's experiences in that way too. So there's a lot of people that are, I, like, I think that general population, I fall into this, <laughs> can be a little bit more on like, I, I can be a little bit more like on the fear side of it. I'm just like, oh no, I can just see people with headsets like zoning out while climate change is getting worse and you know, it freaks me out. But I will say that a lot of people that are really in the field, I have a lot of hopeful, like they see a lot of potential for mental health actually being supported by it in terms of empathy opportunities or different types of um, experiences that create deep relaxation. Like there's there's a lot of folks that see, and I think it's because they're in it in a way where they're actually working with the tools regularly and they're um, talking to researchers that are constantly developing things. So they're really engaged in what's happening right now. And they are quite <coughs> positive, which I think is fascinating. Quite positive about the um, potential for it, connecting people, um, creating, more expansive experiences, healing, more connection between uh, different cultural differences and languages. Like, I, I think that overall that was really uh, inspiring to me and has continued to be to hear um, people that are deeply engaged in the industry's level of hope for the ways that the tools in the right hands, of course, I'm sure, can be used to do a lot of good and do a lot of connecting and Culture. Yeah, I mean, I do think it's important, and like, I really appreciate what you guys are doing, and like, everyone here is such an awesome client. Like, I think it's helpful, just like, we're all here considering this, and we all have a lot of power to, you know, use these things. And yeah, like, perhaps keeping that, like, hopefulness as a driver to, to do positives with this is important, you know. Like, for instance, yeah. my brother. 
like I totally hear all the concerns about like yeah cell phones and I myself like I'm really good at like navigating physical spaces and remembering where I've been but now that we have like iPhone maps like it, it actually has changed my the way that I navigate physical space <laughs> like I don't remember things the same way cause, like I've like outsourced that to my phone sort of so I share those concerns for sure, um, but at the same time, like I have an experience right now. My brother lives in Hong Kong, and he just had a fit, right? And so it's like I can't afford to go there. Like I can go maybe once every two years, but but because we're on WhatsApp and he like shares stuff like video of what they're doing, and con like me and my mom, who's very um, much a luddite, <laughs> like we have actually ra roped her in with her grandchild to like be on WhatsApp with us. And it really, it really is meaningful. Like I really, I was like heartbroken when I left. So I was like, I don't know when I'm gonna see this kid again, you know, but like, yeah. I I do feel like engaged in his life and like, I know, yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I don't think, yeah. I think, I think it is really important for people like this to be like engaged, yeah. And it's like drawing, yeah. inviting, diverse thinking into this. Yeah, life. exactly, and can be leaders in it too. I mean, there's there's opportunity for people to be like, what can I do with these tools? You know, like what story can I tell? What activism can I do? And then that's what I'm excited about with Open Signal. It's like, and then you could maybe have an idea where you're like, I have no idea how I'm going to do that, but maybe there's somebody else who can do the coding or whatever, you know, and start to come together on different ways to collaborate with what's possible with the tools. Um, yeah. I think what you're saying is like that the ability to ask yourself or be prompted to ask yourself what can I do with this even the thought that like you have the ability to interject yourself into that narrative to even think that that question is answerable I think is really important and that's kind of what I was thinking about in like what does this today's version of the digital divide, like what does that mean and what does that look like? Does it, I mean, anyone can like scroll obsessively on a cell phone, but what are they doing with the technology? How are they interjecting themselves and participating in society productively using these tools? And that's why I see like, I mean, I teach digital technologies to youth with the specific intention of like, you know, getting these, seeing new ways that you can use these things as tools to just then open up your mind and be like, oh, I'm gonna go in this completely different direction. Because I see so many youth, like my niece, I wasn't around for a long time and she was living with, like, she's 18 and was like living with me for a while and just like all day long, just yeah. like, and she has no social skills and like she's, totally like what a type of person to be like influencer and she's like seems like would be like the popular kid totally beautiful but she's completely like anxiety ridden like social awkward can't talk to people like really very productively in real life but I think that it's a lot of the using it as the pacification tool, you know? And so if we sort of break out of that and like open these spaces where people are like prompted to think about how you can take these tools and then break them open and interrupt them and mm -hmm. turn them on their head. Yeah. I think it's really exciting. Yeah, and, and that there's so much space for people who want to do that, to present that work and to get seen in this way. Like I as a filmmaker who's always trying to like make a piece that gets into a major festival to me the idea that right now if you wanted to get super into immersive production you would probably have a, a really good chance at making a project that gets to screen at one of the top festivals and then could build you an entire career like you could just get launched in this way that you hear those stories about like 40 years ago or whatever like that's very possible right now it's very possible to create some sort of an augmented reality design that goes viral, you know, which five years from now, you probably won't be able to do that. The whole, the whole industry, the whole field will be saturated differently because it'll be changing. But for people that want to take leadership and want to um, grab the tools and do all the things that you're saying and figure it out, 
um, through sharing and resourcing community. Um, there's a, a very unique potential, I think, for people to make a voice for themselves, build a business, um, just launch a career in this in this new way that, in my opinion, in all the years I've lived, haven't seen quite so like ripe for that type of potential before. Um, and I think it's really interesting. Uh, and the space will only probably still be like this for another you know few years before it becomes a lot more saturated with people that are, which is fine then too. I'm not saying that would be bad then, but there's a lot of potential right now. Um. Like I'm thinking of like the technology to media trends. Like so much media has started in industry, and it sounds like that's where a lot of this is starting is with uh, professionals. Um, and then I'm just trying to think about like what are the what are some of the pieces holding up adoption from consumer on the consumer side right now? I feel like there's there's it's it's an easier sell for business than it is for consumers at this moment. I think I can speak to that. I think uh, we're waiting for some sort of indispensable killer app, like something that is so useful and um, so we, we have the novelty, but we haven't seen the video game that people just can't help but not play or be on board with, or the more universal application that people can't live without. And I think the closest thing we've seen is Google Earth VR, which is an incredible means of visiting any place on the globe, zooming out to where you can handle the globe, Earth like a, like a beach ball in front of you, rotate it, drop a pin on the map, and then literally fly to that location right down the street view, and then teleport around your elementary school or something like that. And it activates these memories that are really only stored in your body that you have access to when you experience a sense of presence at a location. And so I think people try that app and you realize there's like tremendous utility in it just in terms of like, I'm taking a trip uh, to Europe and I want to visit you know certain locations that I'm planning on visiting and um, you can go there and get a real sense for that. Um, more and more interiors are being documented in 360, and those kind of get integrated into Google Earth VR, and you can go to architectural interiors and things like that. Um, but I think it's the combination of like the cost being prohibitive, but then again, you know, modern smartphones are a significant cost, but we've decided there's something, there's, there's so much utility there, it's something we can't live without. Um, so I think it, it has something to do with like an ultra useful application or some combination of ultra useful applications and social VR, because I think that's a pivotal point when you have a critical mass of people that are actually visiting with each other in that sort of like new fidelity. And yeah. I think that's just like a, I think once somebody figures out a social media style way for people to be interacting with these tools, where the people they love and know are also in that same space, that's when it will really take off. But I also think a lot of people just don't know about it. Like that, that was what was, so I ended up on this research project for a variety of reasons, mostly because I just have a lot of experience working with like the film and television industry. So for me to start reaching out to XR industry people, this was a natural, it was easy for me to be like, okay, I can, I can start doing that. Because we were looking for mentors for, um, our new media fellowship, and then the research project kind of came about because of that. And I, what was I just saying right before that? Integrating the social media reach out to them because they're. No, be good. You said people, not a lot of people know about it. And just yeah, like, yeah, okay, so that, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so when I did the research and met all the different people, what was surprising to me personally is that for as involved as I am and as much as I stay up with things, I learned so much in this short period of time. And the people who are working in the field, you know, they are still, it's still like, I don't know, three, four years I'd say is about what most people have been really working in this space. That, like not everyone in, that com in the companies, but it's still so new 
And, and that's why we're excited about it as an organization is that it's not that it's still so new and it's not going to happen. You know, it's, it's still so new and it is happening. Like, no doubt it's coming and it's happening. And we're just a little bit ahead of the curve. So I think the other thing is that people just don't know it exists on the level that it does. They don't know it's coming on the level that it's coming. And they don't know um, what it even means. I mean, that's why like, we, we had to start with just even the terminology. It's just so vast and there's so much different types of potential that the education about what's possible is a big piece of it too. And like what the tools are and what the productions are and what the, you know, everything. And I guess I'm just saying for my own self, I, not that I thought I knew a ton about it at all, but the level of education that I had as somebody who works in media and has for 17 years um, was surprising to myself even. So, I think that that is a big part of it, is that it's just the education of what it is and how it operates and what is possible is not readily available to people yet. And if, if it's not, if we don't like make sure it is, then people who are in the know will be the only ones with the power and the ability to participate. So to me, it's what's most important isn't just the access to the tools and the education and the community building, but also just like making sure people know like, hey, this is here, and there's great jobs, and there's um, all sorts of opportunity to tell stories that really change people's lives, and all of that. Um, so, yeah. It, it would be real nice to see a real mixed community here, and uh, just have them engage with each other, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and start from it, like, like you're going down, but, but, you know, and also, you have to go to the bathroom when you bring it. You have to go inside to the bathroom. You go outside and then we'll yeah. get it. Yeah. I'll be back. I'll be back.
it was the first time. Sure, yeah. Before, now that I've had, I haven't seen it. A lot of people are film producers for sh that they take gear out and they film, yeah, but. Yeah. I, I might just say, uh, I'm, hi, I'm Jeff, yeah. I'm filming. <laughs> um, I work for labs and programs, um, and I work out of McLaren. And so we move gear to McLaren Youth Corrections and we teach things. So we're doing now more like targeted outreach um, to people who don't have access to it, have no idea. So um, I, we do that. I also work at labs. So we just started working in that department where we're working with um, Black filmmaker incubator. Um, so we're doing much more targeted stuff than I think we've ever done before. So stuff is very yeah. nascent and like early on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're doing more fellowship type programs. Um, yeah, and a specific outreach program. Yeah. Organizations. Yeah. Sure. At the same time, to your point, it, to me, it's concerning that this facility is constantly active and like buzzing with activity. And people from the community using it. And you say it used to be, yeah. and that's my sense too. So um, I think part of that is a result of this being sort of a transitional phase for Open Signal, mm -hmm. and Open Signal kind of like really honing in on a mission and an equity plan, and just a strategic plan, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But we are doing targeted outreach, we're doing more um, targeted programs. But I think also one of the things we're facing is when we have events like this and when we have unity classes, it's it feels like it's this self-selecting audience. And I see a lot of like uh, people who would find at visual design agencies like with those skill sets um, already in place, like 2D creative suite type skill sets, and then like uh, artists and art school type people. Mm -hmm. um, but then you know, like a sprinkling of, this, uh, there's there's diversity in there, but it's something that we're obviously working on, working towards, because it's not the sort of diversity that I think is really representative of, of open signals diversity, if that makes sense. Yeah, and is there anything that's reasonable that's going to do to help? It's volunteer driven. I mean, your suggestion of, um, bringing open signal and yeah, these type of experiences to like June 14th and other Juneteenth type of events is a really good idea. The, the, the first, it's, it's a point of access is really important. Mm -hmm. Just like having the experience of high-end virtual reality is like a huge um, deal in terms of just um, wrapping your head around it. Yeah, the experience like, of first person understand and then you have to be told by the way the software to make this these types of experiences is free and open signal offers affordable classes you know, yeah. so scholarships are yeah. I had a question just going back to and we talked sort of in circles about it a couple of times but <clears throat> um, what is in oh you just said it was in water, um, I guess, yeah, like, if there's such a difficulty distinguishing the line between um, mixed reality and augmented reality, like, what is the use of even having the term mixed reality? Like, how did that come into sort of like the lexicon? Like, why is that even? That's a good question. I, I don't know. Do you know? It's just because it's all new and it comes down to like Somebody marketing and it. preferences and perception, you know? It's like there could come a time where virtual reality just as a phrase just has a bad connotation for whatever reason. I'm not saying it does. But um, so companies might prefer to use a different term like mixed reality or um, I've always preferred immersive media. Yeah. Like kind of predicting that maybe there might be a time where virtual reality just has lost like um, people's trust or something like that. Um, and immersive media is more generic. But I, it, it's just an industry that's so new. And I definitely don't get hung up on the 
distinctions. Like, I don't think it's terribly important whether you use MR or AR. Mm-hmm. Pretty much interchangeable. I mostly use VR, AR, and then I'll say XR if it's like a win with a catch all or immersive. It's just kind of a preference, honestly. Yeah. Well, I think, too, you know, we're talking about all these different spaces and different uses for it, but I would, I would say that probably people are and will continue to specialize in just, you know, specific areas. Like, somebody might be like, I'm going to become a medical training VR designer. Like, I do think it'll get more and more specialized in that way, and companies will be able to, you know, people can form different types of businesses based on, you know, I'm going to be a documentary immersive filmmaker, or I'm going to do game design. Like, it... That's what makes it a complex topic, is that it's this umbrella of so many different potentials. Um, But I do think, for my understanding at least, is that for each thing that you could do under the immersive umbrella, they're all like pretty in-depth and specific um, limbs. So it would be, I think that people will continue to specialize differently. Like some people might really just be like, I'm an augmented reality designer, that's what I do. And I mean, people already do. I would imagine that will expand more. Like I said, there will always be the jack of all trade type people that are probably kind of working in the full space, but as the industry forms and the jobs are more clarified and there's job titles that make sense for each aspect of the industry, I'm sure people will become very specialized in what they do. Mm-hmm. There will probably be people that do virtual, do like 3D audio mixing specialists for inside of headsets. I think there's probably already people that do that, but there will be more and more. Mm-hmm. More demand as an actual, like, yeah. Um, the probably be technicians that repair hardware. I mean, there's just going to be so many different kinds of jobs that come out of it. I think that's also why it's so certain that it will happen, is because there's so many idiosyncratic use cases. Mm-hmm. Like, we're all, we're all in it for completely different reasons, you know? And it's, it's that there's such an immense utility for the new hardware and, the, and what it's capable of, but um, it's going to affect all industries, so. I know that I have, like, a pretty specific vision of, like, what I'm interested in and what mm-hmm. I want to do, and it's been really interesting to, like, obsessively keyword search to find something that looks at all kind of like what I'm talking about, that mm-hmm. I want somebody else that's doing something that's, like, kind of similar and I come up with like five different companies that do it sort of like touch on it a tiny bit each of them and then tr- from there like try to find some sort of like you know master's program or like something that's like well that's not really like I want to go to school for that because it's not really you know and so it's been really tricky to find like what sort of training as of right now in the field of how it is where everything is sort of like blossoming so like those really concrete like master's program in like x topic <coughs> are kind of existing already or there are some but they're very they're very specialized and more like i've seen a lot of um you know there's some like program at like mit and different things like that that are more like coding and like um sort of a mix between like either VR stuff or user experience design or things sort of like that. So it's been really interesting just to research on the other end of like having an idea and then like how to make it manifest in this sort of moment. Mm-hmm. And I don't really know. Well, if you want. How to hodgepodge those skills. <coughs> you can contact us and we'll be able to connect you with somebody who can kind of. So I don't know what your idea is, what you want to do, but maybe even that can support. Because um, there might be a way for you to entrepreneurially just do whatever the idea is already. Yeah, that's been tricky. Like, I'm actually, like, um, I already sort of have business that we're working with Livelihood Northwest. And so we have, like, a business coach, but, like, trying to be like, well, I have this idea, but I still need more, I actually need skills <laughs> to make, you know, actual training. Like, I can't really, like, just go tell people that I do that. It's like, this is the thing that I want to do, mm-hmm. you know? And so that's been interesting. And then thinking that, like, I'm not a current student and getting a little bit old feeling 
for like an, in being an intern somewhere, like how to actually get those skill sets if you're not already transitioning from, like I feel like I have a lot of transferable skills, but I'm not actively working for a tech company or like actively working on like a production, a bigger production company that's like that easy transition over. So I think it's super cool that Open Signal is including that idea into like the art and activism community building, but also sort of like career capacity, mm -hmm. like building, yeah, finding this, those pathways. This is your easiest access point uh, for offering uni courses, uni one and two. Granted, they're all filled up right now. I think it was 38 on the list. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> next most successful place to learn Unity and learn immersive workflows is ECC Cascade currently, because there's a tremendous program shaping up there right now. Yeah, I'm super inspired by it. So, um, and I teach Unity there, and I teach Unity here. Um, and then, as Ted mentioned, U of O also. So, three different tiers ways you can start pulling this stuff if you're interested. Are you guys aware like nationally where you like kind of outside to you? Yeah, there's a pretty big, I forget what it's called off the top of my head, but all of the major universities, not all, but a lot of the major universities in New York City have all come together to fund this like virtual reality center. I'm going to look it up because it's really kind of amazing and it's could you use uh, this system to take like a culture that say is in Africa and Our using lab. Lab. Yeah. using traditional art uh, uh, images? And, but if somebody didn't have the money or the materials to do that, uh, have, have them do it virtually and teach them how to use it virtually. Does uh, that make sense? It does. I mean, the equipment itself is cost prohibitive, you know? So the equipment itself is going to cost more than a lot of art supplies, if that's what you mean. But I mean, there are, if the facility had the art, you could come yeah. to the facility and use it down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's, there's really compelling new 3D paints and design applications that are emerging. And one of them is called Torbrush. There's another one called Oculus Medium and Quill and Masterpiece. So those are four different 3D creation tools that you use completely virtually yeah. and you create sculptures and three-dimensional paintings and things like that. Um, and they're, they're just like getting more and more robust features. So I think inevitably it's going to be an incredible creation suite, you know, akin to like Maya or Blender or Photoshop and Illustrator all under one, but, but all virtual. Um, so I think that's really exciting. And that might wind up being, you know, the, the quote-unquote killer app. Um, for some people. I mean, as a way also to draw a community, because it's really we're, other than the camera person, we're all same skin. Mm -hmm. And uh, getting other you know, cultures to come in and this is what you can do from your culture, you know, and, uh, you know as, a, as an incentive in part. You know, if they want to do that, then they have to buy the materials and just use the same. Yeah, I think it's a matter of having access points and having people know where they are. I mean, that's the thing. We've got a lot of high-end virtual reality hardware here now, and the idea is <coughs> come into Open Signal, experience it for yourself, take home a mobile kit, which includes a gaming laptop and a, a Vive, like VR headset controllers. So that's a pretty unique opportunity to be able to take home like a mobile kit with wheels and just set one of these up and then home for a week. Um, so we're trying to offer those services.